We have Josh McKenzie, who's the Cassandra PMC chair, who many of you know. Um, he is going to be talking about the state of the Cassandra development community, uh, a talk that he, as I mentioned before, will also be giving at Cassandra Summit. Um, so we hope to see you there while he expands on his talk. But Josh, why don't you go ahead and take it away? So for those of you that don't know me, I'm Josh McKenzie. Um, I was just realizing before this call, I am going to be in February celebrating my 10-year anniversary with Cassandra. And there's some there's some old timers in the project that have been around for longer than that, but it does make you kind of sit back and reflect um, about not just you know your life choices, but also like what you're what you're doing and what you've done and what the group of people you're working with have done, which is kind of the point of this this whole chat here. Um, right now, I am serving as the PMC chair. Um, the The way the Apache Foundation works, for those that don't know, uh, the PMC is a meritocratic democratic body. We all have the same authority. And one of us just happens to basically be the secretary and liaison to the Apache board. And right now I'm fulfilling that role. Um, people tend to take on a little bit more uh, when they're operating as the PMC chair and like anything that's slipping through the cracks, you end up picking up. So there's there's some, there's some element of increased, um, I guess, movement and work from that perspective. But um, anybody on the PMC has the, the same responsibilities, the same authorities that, that I do. So anything that you have questions about or or whatever else, anybody in the PMC is, is happy to discuss it with you and, and connect. So from a top level perspective, um, this is this is my TLDR. The state of the project is strong. Things are going well. Um, we're going to see some interesting trajectories over time. Um, and yeah, basically, I, re I really enjoyed this quotation, which is a uh, you know, I, I don't know, a month ago, I had an incredibly long beard and long hair and all the gray and the white that I was bringing every call. I was like, nope, there's a difference between getting old and aging. Pay no attention to all the white hair. Um, the project is not stagnating. We are we are changing. We are evolving. We are growing. And it is hard and it is rewarding. Uh, and there's a lot of us. And the, the number of people that are on the project is growing. And we're trying to figure out how to manage the, um, you know, octopus like tentacle complexity of this this ecosystem as the ecosystem grows and as the code base matures and we integrate more novel things. Um, those are all really, really healthy things to be wrestling with. And part of the reason we were able to reach this point was because of the fairly large pause we had in the lead up to 4.0 and improving our correctness and, and validation frameworks. So when we go to make some more invasive changes, we can have confidence they actually work the way that we, we think they do. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So. The way the Apache Foundation looks at things um, is it's, it's held by this tagline, community over code. Um, the idea being the, the community of con contributors that you have is really what drives the, the creation of code and, and the people and the relationships, uh, the health of the ecosystem, the diversity of who you have participating, all of those things are really the, the backbone of whether or not a project is going to be successful or not. Uh, so... In light of that, I'm structuring this kind of in that same uh, in that same flow. Like, let's talk about the community first. Um, so, not just the the folks that are working together to build Cassandra, but you know the the ecosystem around it um, and how that's kind of evolved in the last year. Um, different different integrations and different things that connect with the, the code base itself. Uh, what the health looks like for our committers and our PMC members, because uh, you know we've got to review code and got to get it in and got to vote on releases. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about those releases and kind of what things look like in terms of our contributions, where they're coming from, what the flow rate looks like, how big they are. Um, I like the I like the structure of this really. Um, and we'll get there uh, because graphs for me, it's a lot easier as a human to kind of process um, line go up, line go down. Right. Like that's a lot easier than spreadsheet of numbers bashing you in face. So we'll see if you all agree with me or not. Um, so. We have we have gone back and forth, and the, the Cassandra community is really interesting uh, in that a lot of us have contributed to Cassandra um, being sponsored by different people over time. When you're in an ecosystem for as long as many of us have been, um, you know sometimes you'll be getting paid by a startup, sometimes you'll be getting paid by a large company, uh, sometimes you go back and forth, sometimes you're doing it on the weekend while you're doing some other job, trying to convince yourself you can leave Cassandra, and then you come back six months later. I'm definitely not speaking from experience there. Um, it takes all kinds. And we're, we're kind of in this experiment now uh, with open source where we have this orthogonal community of collaborators and, and contributors to this project. And Cassandra, in a lot of ways, is like the backbone and the life's work and the career trajectory for a lot of us. And part of the question becomes, OK, where where should I be right now? 
to continue to engage with this community, to continue to contribute to this, to continue to leverage the relationships I have, the expertise I have, the, the curiosity and the unscratched itches that are still in Jira years later that need to be closed. Um, we're all dragging a lot of this along with us. And I think there's some celebration to be had there. Um, we're, we're all definitely a, an active community. And it's been incredibly exciting in the last year or two to see some new names and new faces showing up and to be able to welcome people, to be able to have a code base that can actually receive people now and where they can read through and see what the structure is of things, to have documentation on the website that is uh, a lot more clear. Um, the, so much incredible work has gone to the onboarding and community building aspect of things. So let's take a look. Let's, let's start out with um, the, the contribution uh, structure like the number of unique contributors, how many different people engage with Cassandra. Now, what you see here is a pattern you will see repeat. There was a very interesting uh, kind of flow and structure and leading through, you know, 20, 2015, 2014 and 2015, where um, a, lot of, a lot of folks, a lot of Apache projects were trying to figure out how do we appropriately engage with companies, with vendors, with people who are getting paid to work on a project full time versus this is a, a small open source project that is put together by weekend warriors who are able to grind things out in, you know, two hours a week. Like it turns out like rewriting your mem table format with a novel tri-based indexing structure is not a two hour a week kind of thing. That's a, your brand and working full time on this thing that has been your white whale for years kind of, kind of issue. So anyway, between right around that 2015 to 2016 trajectory, um, there was, kind of a, a pullback and a figure out of how do we become more diverse? How do we, um, how do we not concentrate uh, the, the contributions from single areas and, and people were moving around? And what we've seen is over the course of the, the freeze leading up to 4.0 and then moving on past about 2019 is we're kind of gradually ticking back up in a more sustainable, healthy, uh, kind of diverse structure uh, and, and perspective. So I'm really happy about where we are. I'm really happy about our relationship as a project um, with all the different stakeholders that are using Cassandra, that are relying on it for uh, whatever they're doing with their business. Um, and yeah, so we're, we're in a pretty good spot on unique contributors and it's it's heading up. So total commits, this is a fun one. Um, we don't include the Accord feature branch. We don't include the um, transactional cluster metadata. Uh, that being said, commit count is a not terribly useful vanity metric all the time uh, because for instance, TCM, uh, the, the replacement for gossip, our, our nodes all kind of know the state of their schema that merged last week, pretty sure is one commit with over 900 files and 80,000 lines of code. So like one commit is not one commit is not one commit. Um, so all that being said, uh, it's still kind of interesting to look and see we have this same kind of trajectory of spiking up to late 2016, there was a bit of an ebb, a bit of a flow. And after 2019, after the end of the 4.0 freeze, after stabilization of the database, we see an uptick and we see things spiking back up again. Um, this is, again, it's it's one metric amongst many to kind of look at. And you never want to take one of these things as being the, the sole source of truth. Um, I I had to get repo locally and a Python script. And I was like, what other things can I can I dig out here? Um, kind of curious, like per email address, like for all those unique contributors, how many commits are they doing? This is a really interesting one because the higher this number is, I would argue, the the less diverse things are. Um, what we're seeing is that on average, most people are kind of floating around the you know low to mid to single digit commit count um, per year, which is actually kind of a really good sign. It implies there's a lot of diversity in who's engaging as opposed to um, you know single individuals with massive amounts of commits. And anyway, average is also a bad number, right? You should look at the media and you should look at your tails. Like we all, we all know how numbers work in statistics. If we look at the uh, number of unique contributors versus the average per contributor, um, you can see that we're holding pretty steady there. There's no, no real great change in terms of um, individuals being less engaged over time. Um, and it has kind of remained with, I would, I would argue the itch scratching phenomena where people uh, have a thing that they need to work on, a feature they need to get in, they get that done. Um, and frankly, in this code base, a lot of stuff takes a long time. And so if you work on something for two quarters and then get that thing reviewed and merged in, well, congrats, you have two commits a year. So that's part of the reality of infrastructure software. But to me, it's, it's heartening and it's good to see that there's no great changes on this front and we remain steady and remain strong. Um, <laughs> I probably should have run this graph and removed myself. 
uh, from the dev list because I have a nasty habit of being like, well, we all keep talking about this thing. Let's just have a mailing thread and hash it all out. And that's probably kind of how I ended up where I am right now. Um, we have we have continued to um, kind of increase pretty significantly the amount of conversation we're having on our dev list. Um, a unique part of the Apache Foundation, which is worth understanding, is kind of this ethos of if it did, didn't happen on the mailing list, it didn't happen. Uh, the idea being if you have a conversation and a thread on Slack, not everybody's on Slack. If you have a video call with somebody and you talk about something, it might as well have not happened, right? Like things need to hit the dev mailing list and the user mailing list. So everybody has access to see what's going on and everybody can participate. There's there's definitely an inclusivity um, piece of that. And what I didn't actually pull out here uh, is the length of these dev list threads. I, I would contend they're probably getting longer and longer as we you know, get more and more into some of the nuance and some of the complexity of what it is we're trying to achieve, which has never been done before. When we look at the the dev user list, or sorry, the, the, the mailing list for users, this is a part where I was a little surprised when I started pulling the numbers and I was wondering, okay, like are people not using Cassandra as much? Are they not talking about it? Is it just so easy to use? Users don't need to actually talk to each other. Um, and I don't actually think any of those are true. Uh, I think where people are congregating is changing, which is me kind of, you know, foreshadowing this, this little slidey do right here, where on the, and, and these were the numbers from a couple of months ago, the numbers are probably fairly different right now. Um, but the, the number of people that are hanging out in the planet Cassandra discord is massively higher than what's hanging out in the, the ASF chat channels. Now, there's a, a definite argument to be made and a discussion to be had about the fact that the Apache Slack server, you require an invite to. And so that barrier to entry, a lot of people will bounce off of. Um, but those people may be landing in Planet Cassandra. So there's a, there's a, you know, a, a large question mark to, to noodle on as a project in terms of, you know, how much do we all focus on engaging with people on Discord? Is the Planet Cassandra name and structure on Discord the right thing? Uh, is that something that if it's not under the governance of the project, should we talk about it and make it a more formal thing and make it a first class citizen that competes with the hashtag Cassandra channel? So these, there's no right answer to any of this stuff. Um, but I will definitely say um, the number of Discord servers that I personally belong to on all kinds of very random topics and the ease of entering and finding a community and connecting with them. Um, there's something to be said for that, but it's also the Wild West. It's incredibly challenging, if not impossible, to to govern and to navigate. So that's where I would say, you know, where we are right now is healthy. I don't see any concerns with it. I don't think any of us need to, to be too worried about it. But I would say, you know, just, just make sure if you're a contributor on Cassandra or a developer and you're not hitting the, the hashtag Cassandra user channel and you're not inside the Planet Cassandra channel, try to take like five minutes just to be there on both. Um, not just for purposes of building our community, but also because the more you connect with our actual users, uh, the better of a feel you have for the impact of the work that we do and for some of the aesthetic choices that we're making and the impact that has on our users. Um, yeah, it's always incredibly enlightening and eye-opening to connect with actual people who are using something. And then you say, oh, I, I never would have thought someone would have done that with this feature. And here we are. So a delightful vanity metric that a lot of people get bent out of shape about and or excited about is the glorious DB Engine ranking. I restricted this down to just wide column stores. Um, I was talking to Ligron before this call and Cassandra is kind of in this weird spot where we're like a key key value store and we're, you know, a, a key value to a collection of rows and that's going to become a little bit more nebulous after a cord releases if you can do um, atomic transaction across multiple partitions. And so anyway, this, this is just one of those things that's worth looking at and saying, are we okay? How are things going? Is the line going up or going down or staying steady? Line staying steady. It's the logarithmic scale. I'll take it. I'm not too worried about it. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how this, how this goes over time. It'll be interesting to see once we, once we start looking into some of what the transactional metadata allows us to do. And also, big time, what a court allows users to do from a data bundling perspective. Um, but you know, even with the the you know effectively multi year pause to get four O stabilized, uh, even without five O having released yet, with a massive number of really really significant performance improvements um, inside the system, um, without storage attached indexes to allow people to you know index their data and query it, um, we've been holding pretty strong. So Cassandra's doing something right. Um, and yeah, I feel pretty good about that, but I also think that there's definitely room to be humble in the face of it and consider, you know, what are other people doing? So I'm not sure why I had still highlighted at that point, but I did. 
So there we have it. All right. So that is the a beach in the face of graphs kind of piece of things. I think there's more. You should be ready for the, for there being more. Um, but one thing I would I would point out is ecosystems are always stronger than uh, monocultures. And one of our weaknesses as a project historically has been the, I would say the ethos, the posture, the philosophy of saying, we do the database and the rest is up to you. Um, up to and including drivers, right? Like we used to have drivers in the ecosystem. They were pulled out because governance of drivers was orthogonal to the core database itself. Then you end up with all kinds of logic and, and failover and retry that lives inside the driver and all these different drivers that are implemented. And the whole thing was just, just challenging. Um, Everybody needed a sidecar. We didn't have one. So everybody wrote a sidecar. And then we found ourselves in that spot where we're like, well, clearly we should have one. But oh, crap, now everybody has their own. And so if we promote anybody's, then everybody else has to rewrite to that. What do we do? So we've been facing some pretty challenging um, downstream repercussions uh, from the pretty laser focus that we've had on the database. Uh, the, the empathetic understanding side of me says, like, we come by that honestly. Like distributed systems are hard. Cassandra is hard. Like doing writing this code, building this system is not an easy lift. And asking a set of engineers and and a community to also do all the other things that are inside it while they're trying to prove out the core technology itself. Like at some point, you just end up not having enough, enough humans and, and heartbeats to do the thing you're trying to do. Um, but we have grown, we have matured, and as of this year, we have governance rules ratified to govern our sub projects. And it's pretty clean. It's pretty straightforward. We've got a few PMC members that stand for each sub project just to make sure that they can cut releases. Um, right now, the sidecar and the spark bulk writer and reader are formal sub projects underneath the umbrella of the Apache Foundation and governed by the PMC. Um, at the time that I wrote this, the Java and Python driver donation was in progress. It still kind of technically is because I don't know if we can cut releases quite yet, but that's in flight. And I was talking to Nick about that last week. Um, these are all really big deals. Uh, having the ability to um, have a, you know, when somebody comes into the Cassandra ecosystem and saying, how do I run this thing? You know, where, is there a sidecar for it? How do I integrate it with Kubernetes? How do I get data out of this thing and do analytics against it? And being able to have an answer, even if it isn't necessarily a perfect answer for everybody, um, there's definitely something to be said for the 80-20 the rule uh, and the ability to give people a lot more, you know, optionality and, and choice when they're working on things. <laughs> So sub, sub projects are doing well, um, and we could expect to see some some more of those come up over time as more things become, you know, like widely used. Right? You see something pop up enough times, and you start to ask the question, "Hey, maybe we should uh, maybe we should think about integrating it." For integrations, there's there's a lot. Um, a lot of folks have integrated with Cassandra over the years. You can you can just Google it and, and see all the magic. Um, it's a great thing. It's a blessing and a curse because as a developer of a database, you end up wedded to the APIs that you've created. And you can you can see that show up on our dev list periodically where we're like, oh dear God, we're gonna add a add an API member. We're gonna be like married and have kids with this thing for the rest of our lives. Let's make sure it's right. Um, because you get an API wrong and it is painful. Like it's painful for the users. It's painful for you to maintain. It's painful to deprecate and to migrate um, to the point to where all of us are still using JMX with Cassandra years and years later when we're all like, yeah, it's not, not the best, but when it works and the lift to change it would be so painful. But Anyway, we're getting there. Um, we're, we're moving in a good direction. And Cassandra has, you know, repeatedly proven itself. Like, it's, it's very uncommon to be able to look at a database and have that same feeling in your gut about its stability as you do about, like, an old Nix-based, Unix-based server, where you're like, I've got 680 days of uptime. I am not interested in rebooting this machine. I don't know if it'll come back. That's how people feel about Cassandra. They're like, I've had zero downtime for the last three and a half years. I, you know, we're good. Like, let's not, let's not move too much on this thing. So it, it is definitely core infrastructure, the backbone of a lot of a lot of different companies and you know, people's livelihoods. From a perspective of the committers on the project, um, we the, the way that we run things, uh, there's two different kind of tiers in governance. One is committers, one is PMC members. Um, for us, we treat committers a little differently in that we grant them um, binding rights on technical votes. So usually, if somebody's make, you know putting in a vote for, hey, I'm going to review this code, I'm going to commit it. Uh, it's only PMC members that would come in and say, hey, binding minus one, this has problems X, Y, and Z. Um, in our case, we we moved that uh, deliberately to the, the committers themselves and said, basically, look, if you if we trust you to review code and to merge code and to commit code, we should also trust you to be able to come in and say, I see real problems with this code. We shouldn't, we shouldn't merge it in. 
Um, and yeah, so far so good. Um, we have 22 PMC members that are active right now at 36, which is actually quite high for a project of this age. Um, we do a roll call periodically because for, for things that are binding over the long term, we want to be careful not to, um, you know, just do a simple majority. And if you really want to go down a rabbit hole, like look into all the theory about democracy and simple majority versus super majority and, um, all, all that, that, all that magic. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're in a good spot. Things are rattling along pretty well with our governance. Uh, Francisco uh, was just uh, voted in as a committer quite recently. I've worked with him on um, a variety of different things. Uh, he's done a lot of work on the sidecar and on the rest of the project as well. Um, and he's, he's a delight to work with. So if you get a chance, definitely connect with him. Um, and we kind of hope to see this ramp up as the, the driver ecosystem gets merged in, as more people get active on the sidecar. Um, and yeah, the more, the more the merrier. So code, um, if you ever want to be really entertained, go, go read some of Ada Lovelace's notes to Charles Babbage back in the day. When I was putting this together, I got I was a serious rabbit hole. Uh, she had some strong opinions um, that he should stop trying to correct her math and her math was perfectly fine. And it turns out she was right and he needed to just shut up. But um, there's building a thing and analyzing a thing are two very, very different things. And we find that again and again um in this in this code base so let's take a look at our releases and how long it took what was the dev time on each release so you can see there's a little bit of an outlier on this chart right um and this is actually part of what we're running into right now this is part of our existential debate about 5.0 is you know are we swinging the pendulum back too far do people want one release a year every 12 months do they want it every year and a half are they crazy or want it once a month like i don't know um a lot of different people want a lot of different things and when it comes to infrastructure software and validation we have to figure out you know what's the right what's the right cadence for this thing there's a definite tension to releasing more incrementally and rapidly versus having slow larger um kind of monolithic releases uh usually centering around if you miss the cutoff for a release when can you expect whatever you've built to actually be available and be in users' hands. And there is no right answer to this. Um, this is not something that we as a project have settled on and have you know one true way to do. Uh, and frankly, we're debating it about 5.0. We were debating it about, you know, do we want to just push 5.0 to next year and try to get transaction cluster metadata and accord in there and stabilized? And, you know, or do we want to cut this right now and then cut 5.1 when they're available? And it kind of seems like the winds are blowing that ladder way to get 5.1 in the hands of users and um you know, try to be, I guess, humble in the face of there's a lot of uncertainty and unknowns. Um, but 4.0 was definitely an anomaly. Um, I want to be mindful of our time here. I, there's too much in my brain to get out in these discussions. 4.0, we were really moving from a world in which Thrift was our first class citizen in our storage engine to CQL. That actually happened in our 3.0 release. But the validation of it, the kicking the tires, the realizing we needed significantly more robust testing that didn't actually exist not just in our ecosystem, but, you know, in the world as a framework at the time meant that there was, there was a lot of debt to be paid, uh, when it came to that 3.0 to 4.0 transition. Um, the work, like there was, there was a joke that Jonathan Ellis, you know, who was, you know, like engineer zero on the project after it was open source made about Sylvain Lebrun, who's done a lot of work inside the storage engine, who wrote 8099 was really that like he used his godlike powers to forge code out of them. And I look at that and I'm like, I don't know how that man wrote that patch without even using an IDE um, and rewrote the storage engine. It's a testament to his, his skill and capability, but also the fact that we migrated from the Thrift API to CQL and then we migrated the storage engine from being Thrift-based to CQL-based meant there was a lot of implicit undocumented things the system did and behaviors that we just didn't have exercised anywhere. And it wasn't until it was out in the wild that we realized that. And so that version three to version four timeframe you see there was really us recalibrating ourselves as a project in terms of the amount of discipline and maturity that we needed to have uh, towards the role this project plays in people's infrastructure and in their business and their lives. So anyway, a lot more detail than you probably needed. So Jira is resolved by year. This looks oddly familiar. Um, spikes up, drops down, going back up and climbing back up. Very similar to the question about commits, where a commit is not a commit is not a commit. One JIRA could represent multiple orders of magnitude more work than another, but it is you know, useful to just kind of look at and see, you know, is there, is there a canary in the coal mine? Um, the number of new featured JIRAs that we have per year, I was entertained by this one. So we've, we've had this narrative we tell ourselves of, hey, we went slow to go fast. We wanted to stabilize things. We wanted to get all the testing written. So that way we can hit the ground running. So the question is, is the proof in the pudding? Are we actually doing that? 
And the answer is yes, we actually are. There's a lot of stuff coming into the system um, and it's behaving itself. So numbers and graphs don't tell the whole story. Um, with with 4.1, um, there was, I realized looking at the slide. <laughs> so Andres put in guardrails, uh, De La Pena Garcia. He's um, really, really great. Is it Garcia? Anyway, Andres. Um, he's a great engineer. And so I put in a bunch of guardrails in there too, this question of like, should people have the ability to disable certain features they don't want to run? Uh, the, the deny list allows you to block certain partitions. Um, but those are kind of like our headliners. 4.1 wasn't really that large of a release. Um, there's a lot of stuff that went into it. Don't get me wrong. But in terms of like, hey, what are your new features? But then when you look at 5.0, you've got, you know, a new structure for your mem tables, a new structure for your SS tables that has massive implications for, for performance and scale. You've got native indexes. You've got vector search. You've got a new compassion strategy that is, in theory, trying to get us the best of all worlds. Uh, like there's there's so much stuff that's gone into 5.0, even not thinking about transactional cluster metadata, which reboots our ability to you know bootstrap multiple nodes at a time or do subpartition addressing as a future feature and Accord. I, I don't even know if I need to say more about that, but like Accord is just a total paradigm shift for your ability to data model and use Cassandra. Like looking at those numbers, you see a line goes up into the right, and then looking at a list of what is the identity of a release. Already, there's really, really significant, novel, never before done things that are happening in this project and that are happening at scale, at speed, and with stability. Um, we have a, a process that we call the CEP process. Um, a lot of other open source projects have them as well. The whole idea is to try to kind of split out the design from the implementation a little bit and get some buy in, get a little early consensus so you don't show up with a massive patch and then have somebody come along and minus one you at the end. Um, we didn't have any of those for 4.0. We've got 7 and 4.1. We've got 12 and 5.0. It's accelerating. Uh, the structure seems to be working. If anybody has any frustrations or concerns with it, they would definitely let, let all of us know because um, it's, a, it's a work in progress, just like all of this. From a quality perspective, we've been looking at moving towards having a homogenous uh, on-demand cloud-native CI system, basically have CI that can be turnkey that anybody else can use. And there's a lot moving on this front. Um, this is an incredibly complex, challenging distributed problem. Um, just to run the, the basic suites is something like, I don't know, 15 and a half thousand, 16,000 um, different test suites that are striped across hundreds of different execution nodes. and. Yeah, you know, it's a distributed system issue. And we've been adding tests for the last 15 years. And I don't know that anybody's ever systematically gone in and looked at pruning or removing any tests. Um, so it's a problem that just kind of keeps growing. And it's one of those things where you can keep throwing money and hardware at the problem, but that doesn't do anything for the complexity. That doesn't do anything for the ability to separate signal from noise. Uh, so we've got a lot of things that we've done um, where there's a, there's a Butler uh, web page that'll show you for each build, what has failed? Is it flaky? Is it a consistent failure? Um, we've got a build lead role that kind of ebbs and flows based on the state of the um, the builds of people that take a look at Butler and make sure things are reflected in Jira. Um, Mick, who is the, he's been on the project for a good long time, previous PMC chair. Um, he's been working on CI um, in the ASF side. I've been working on breaking things out to a declarative CI system that everybody can kind of inherit from and share. So there's a lot going on here. Um, much like our stabilization in 4.0, we're paying off debt. Like there's there's a lot that has happened here that hasn't really gotten the kind of attention and care and feeding that it deserves. Uh, and th the issue with these kind of things is it's the it's the slow poison that will kill you, where you don't realize that the reason you have taken a massive hit to your momentum um, with contribution is because of the death by a thousand cuts that's happening to you from CI. Or the death by a thousand cuts that's happening to you because you haven't cleaned up your architecture and dealt with you know old standing interconnected dependencies, et cetera. Like this is this is the kind of thing that's gonna gonna keep us alive um, well past fifteen years. So my takeaways: um, we continue to change, we continue to introspect, we continue to look at what we're doing and try to figure out is it working, and if not, what do we need to do about it, and what have other people done about it. And does it work for us or does it not? And do we need to in, you know, invent something novel? Or is the thing that we're calling novel just round with spokes in it and you attach it to a wagon and we need to get out of our own way and realize like there's prior art and things are good. Um, we're constantly figuring that out. And the way these open source projects work, specifically the way the Apache Foundation works is that happens on mailing lists. That happens in public. That happens with us talking to each other and figuring it out together. 
And I guess having the the bravery and the, the trust in each other that we all just want what's best for the project and nobody's out here to, to get anybody and we're going to disagree and that's actually healthy and we'll just keep, you know, turning the crank. So we're close. So here's takeaways. Where users gather is changing. Their water and holes are moving. We need to make sure that we follow them and also help kind of guide as well based on what we need to do. Um, turns out working together actually works. Shouldn't actually just you know, drop a 40,000, 50,000 line patch after two years of work without telling anybody because things get ugly and, and it's painful. And so the the lightweight breakout that we've done is working. Um, you know, it's got its own set of challenges, but it goes. Um, testing is worth it. Testing is worth it. 4.1 had some changes in it and it was stable. 5.0 is looking good. Uh, transactional cluster metadata got merged in and there were some test breakages from that. But for a patch of that size to have, I think it's like 0.002% test breakage from something that just fundamentally reboots the way we think about things. Um, that's a testament to all the hard work that went into the, the simulator that went into Harry, the fuzz testing that goes into everybody working through cleaning up our tests and burning down tests that had been... <laughs> unstable over time. And to wrap it back up, what I first stated, we're in a good spot. State of the project is strong. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.